as trains rattled into this station here at Hume End, the terminus of the Leek and Manifold Valley Light Railway. It's difficult to imagine the scene. I'm standing outside the building which accommodated the booking office and waiting room. To my left, the engine sheds and carriage sheds. Renovated, looking different, but still in the same position. Station staff would hear the whistle of the engine echoing around the hills as it made its way up the valley and before too long a plume of smoke as it pulled up the gradient from Ecton and then arriving in the station a couple of minutes later. While the passengers were alighting and other passengers boarding, the engine would be uncoupled, run up here a little way and then back round the run-round loop to take on coal and water as required. In those days, there was a canopy above the platform to give the passengers some shelter. Alongside the door was a station seat, and on here was the train timetable. But let's go inside. Well, this is the booking office, and still here today is the very same hatch where people bought their tickets. And this particular ticket was issued on the first day of operation. It's ticket number 26, from Humen to Waterhouses, and it cost one and three. In today's money, about six new pence. It doesn't sound very much money today, but back in 1904, when the line opened on the 27th of June, sixpence would buy over a pound of butter or two and a half pounds of cheese. The grand opening at Waterhouses was heralded with much gaiety and rejoicing. The village, midway between Leek in Staffordshire and Ashbourne in Derbyshire, was decked out in fine style with triumphal arches erected across the main road. One welcomed the Earl of Dartmouth, who'd been invited to perform the opening ceremony. Another proudly declared, success to the Leek and Manifold Valley Light Railway Company, a toast which was drunk throughout the day by its many supporters, who saw the new railway accommodation as a forerunner of an era of improved prosperity for the district. Members of the Calden Low Brass Band added their measure of rejoicing as the time drew near for the inaugural train to depart on its first official journey to Hume End. At 21 minutes past 11, the train, hauled by the company's two engines, E.R. Calthrop and J.B. Earl, eased away from the temporary station to great applause. Because of the late delivery of two of the four carriages, a number of guests had to be seated on two goods wagons, as in the pioneering days of steam. The Leakin Manifold was one of the first lines to be built in accordance with the Light Railways Act of 1896, an act which allowed light railways to be built to less stringent standards than normal practice, and hence less cost, through districts held back due to inadequate means of transport. This relaxation gave birth to numerous projects, both full gauge and narrow gauge, as in the case of the eight and a quarter mile L and M, which was two feet six inches between the metals. The Leek and Manifold Light Railway was conceived with the idea of opening up the country districts of the Staffordshire Moorlands so that the farming communities could have an improved means of transport to the market town of Leek, where they sold their eggs and butter. This meant a great deal to them, especially in winter, when the hilly moorland roads became impossible to negotiate. The line, due to its pioneering nature, attracted a great deal of attention from the railway journals of the day. Understandably, they were eager to introduce the new era of light railway construction to their readers and to highlight the many unique features and facilities provided by its designer, Mr. Everard Calthrop. Everyone has heard of Dovedale, but the Manifold Valley, which roughly speaking may be said to run parallel with it, is to most people a terra incognita. Thanks to the new light railway, thousands of excursionists will become acquainted with what is undoubtedly some of the finest scenery in North Staffordshire. From Waterhouses, the line of narrow gauge construction, two feet six inches being the adopted measurement, extends in a northerly direction for eight and a quarter miles, following the valleys of the Hamps and the Manifold to the hamlet of Hume End, just a few miles from the villages of Hartington and Warslow on the high road to Leek by way of Morridge and Thorncliff Bank. The Leek and Manifold and its equipment have been built entirely to the designs of Mr. E. R. Calthrop, a member of both the electrical and the mechanical institutions. 
In conducting the survey, Mr. Calthrop obviously took every advantage afforded by the conformation of the country. And this, combined with the great flexibility of alignment provided by the two foot six inch gauge, has enabled the railway to be constructed with a minimum amount of cuttings and embankments. The weight of the rail employed is 35 pounds to the yard, and it is secured to transverse wooden sleepers. The bed of the permanent way is metalled with limestone and is laid in a most substantial manner. The minimum curve employed is four chains, and the maximum gradient no more steep than one in 41. Mr. Calthrop's premise for an axle load of five tons should ensure minimum wear of the permanent way, while allowing the rolling stock to be designed for maximum carrying capacity. The bridges, totaling some 24 in number, are of simple character, and in only one case was it found necessary to construct a short tunnel of 164 yards, and this being undertaken in order not to disfigure Sir Thomas Wardle's picturesque property at Swainsley. The greatest interest of the new line undoubtedly centres on the rolling stock and its adaptability for the varying conditions of work that it is called upon to perform. It has been designed upon similar lines to the stock that Mr Calthrop provided for the Barzee Light Railway and is larger than any that has been put on a two foot six gauge in Great Britain. In fact, special sanction had to be obtained from the Board of Trade for the dimensions desired by Mr Calthrop. The coaches, carried on four-wheel bogies, are 42 feet long over the headstocks, 8 feet wide overall, and 10 feet high from rail level to the top of the roof, giving around 6 feet 6 inches headroom inside. It will be appreciated that these dimensions are very little less than the dimensions of a main-line English railway coach, and are far greater than those of a large number of coaches still in use on standard gauge railways in this country. The coaches of centre gangway saloon style are of two types, namely composite, first, third and guards compartment, and third class coaches. Two coaches of each design have been provided. The composite coaches seat 20 third class passengers and eight first class, while the third class have seating accommodation for 40 passengers. Any doubts as to the stability of the coaches are immediately dispelled after riding in them. They travel so smoothly that once inside and underway, one might well imagine oneself in a corridor coach on one of the main line English railways. Before the opening ceremony, the coaches were tested at a speed of 30 miles an hour over the entire railway. The normal running speed is, however, 12 miles per hour. But coaches have little application without a locomotive. The two engines which have been supplied are in fact a modification of those which have given so much satisfaction on the Barzilite Railway and built by Kitsons of Leeds. They are six-wheeled, coupled, having driving wheels two feet six inches in diameter with a rigid wheelbase of only six feet. The boiler pressure is 150 pounds per square inch. The overall weight of each engine is only a little short of 27 tonnes. The water capacity is 600 gallons, the bunker capacity 1 tonne. A feature which captures the attention is the large lamp carried above the buffer beam. It remains to be seen, however, whether it will be used to illuminate the road through the hills of North Staffordshire. The most novel feature of the railway is Mr Calthrop's patent transportation car, which aroused much interest when its unique design was demonstrated at Hume End following the inaugural run from Waterhouses. The car is designed to carry standard gauge stock over the two foot six inch gauge metals from Waterhouses to points along the valley route, so avoiding all the inconvenience associated with transshipment, thus retaining all the advantages of the narrow gauge. The bogies of the transportation car, together with all other kindred parts, are entirely enclosed by the body of the vehicle, which has been kept as low as possible. From the lower edges of the body extending outwards on either side are two platforms, each about 18 inches wide. Where these platforms join onto the sides of the vehicle, they are constructed with slots, which serve as the rail to receive the wheels of the standard gauge wagon. 
These rails are located only some 10 inches above the running surface of those of the narrow gauge. The two cars available at present have a tear weight of 4 tons 1500 weight and can carry a load of 20 tons. On arrival at their valley destination, the standard gauge wagons are stabled on short lengths of full gauge track, thus releasing the transportation cars for other duties, a most efficient practice. It is understood that further cars will be ordered from Messrs Cravens Limited of Sheffield once experimental in-service trials have been completed. Two low-sided bogey goods wagons, built by the Leeds Forge Company, are intended for carrying general freight. Each is capable of carrying a load of 14 and a half tons, their weight being five and a half tons, including vacuum brake gear. Between Waterhouses and Hume End, seven stations have been provided. Sparrow Lee, Beeston Tor, Grindon, Thor's Cave, Wetton Mill, Butterton, and Ecton for Warslow. The majority of the stations, stationettes perhaps being a more descriptive word, are provided with a capacious wooden building called by the railway company a bungalow. Tickets are not available from these wayside halts. Passengers boarding the train at points along the valley can purchase them from the guard. Booking office facilities, it will be appreciated, have been provided at both Waterhouses and Hume End. The platforms are low and essentially level with the rails, but perfectly adequate for the duty which they are called upon to provide. At Hume End, not surprisingly, the facilities have been laid out based on the aspirations that the company have for extending their line in the direction of Buxton. There is an excellent station building providing all that is necessary for the convenience of travellers, including a booking office and waiting room, and stabling for both the locomotives and the carriages. The advertised timetable from August the 1st shows that there will be three trains each way every weekday, augmented on a Wednesday, Thursday and Saturday with additional services. The journey time in each direction is 45 minutes and the line will be worked on the principle of one engine in steam or two engines coupled together. When the standard gauge branch has been completed from Cheddleton Junction, so providing a service through to Leek and the Pottery Towns, it is reasonable to expect that all anticipations for the narrow gauge will be fully realised and that it will become, especially if an extension to Buxton can be achieved, one of the best paying lines in the country. And so the railway was born. Colourful in many respects, even down to the livery of the locomotives and rolling stock. Chocolate brown was chosen for the locomotives with a double white lining. The coaches were very attractive, enhanced by primrose yellow livery lined out in black. In common with the class numbers, the company logo was highlighted in a richly decorated script emblazoned on the coach sides. To meet statutory requirements, an established railway company had to work the line. Since the North Stafford Company had applied jointly with the directors of the Manifold Company to the Light Railway Commissioners for the award of an order allowing the building of Railways 1, 2 and 3, the broad gauge from Cheddleton Junction to Waterhouses and their Colden Quarries, and Railway 4, the narrow gauge, the role of Big Brother naturally fell on the shoulders of the NSR for the day-to-day -day operation of the line from Waterhouses to Hume End in return for 55% of the gross receipts. The North Staffordshire Railway. A new country for botanists, geologists and nature lovers generally. Passengers desiring to visit the beautiful country opened out by the Manifold Valley Line can travel to Leek by North Stafford train. From Leek to Waterhouses by motor omnibus, thence by the Toy Railway to their destination. Owing to construction problems not helped by bad weather, 
the NSR line from Leakbrook to Waterhouses had not been completed. And so, to serve the isolated manifold, the NSR introduced two Straker steam buses of 35 horsepower, each licensed to carry 22 passengers. The service started at Leak Railway Station. Passenger access was by means of a platform at the rear. Underway, they thundered through the streets. The iron-tired wheels caused tremendous vibration and did immense damage to the roads, toppled window displays and were banned from the main thoroughfares. The journey to Waterhouses took an hour. Overloading was not uncommon, with reports of as many as 42 being crammed aboard on occasions. The buses were painted Madder Lake with yellow lining, the upper portion of the body around and above the windows being finished in cream. They became notorious, a slow torture for those crowded within, a menace for all who happened to cross their path along the way. The contraptions became known as Earthquake 1 and 2. In the first month, over 1,500 passengers were carried, in the words of the handbills, to enjoy the scenery of the most beautiful and varied description, which could not but fail to delight and charm all lovers of the picturesque. Passenger returns over the manifold line made encouraging reading. £79 in July, £206 in August and £140 in September. If only the connection with the North Stafford branch had been ready for use, we would have been overwhelmed with traffic, retorted the directors. If only, a phrase that was destined to be carried over the years on the winds that blew from the hill country of North Staffordshire. In August, the two outstanding carriages left Preston for the manifold. During a shunting operation at Macclesfield, one was badly damaged and had to be returned for repairs. The board decided that two further transporter wagons should be put in hand. Enclosure of the carriage sheds cost £30, and their painting, along with the engine shed, added a further £15. Annual General Meeting of the Directors and Shareholders, October 1904. Colonel Bill MP, Chairman of the Light Railway Company. I am sure all present will agree that unmitigated congratulation is indeed the order of the day. Your directors have handed over the line to the North Stafford Company to operate with our fullest confidence, and we are sure that it will give ample satisfaction to all connected with it. The extension from Hume End to Buxton is receiving the serious consideration of the directors. Such an extension would undoubtedly lead to a large additional traffic. <laughs> However, the question will have to remain unsettled for the immediate future. On the question of accounts, I am unable to present a full statement. However, I hope to do so once we have all our liabilities assembled in due course. Costs in making the railway have risen. Therefore, it is the intention of the board to call upon shareholders to take up £5,000 of additional capital and to call upon the government to either grant or lend the extra money involved. I have no fear whatsoever to the money being readily found, as the Light Railway Commissioners would assist them, if necessary, by way of debentures. And so, on the 16th of November 1904, a further issue of £5,000 of ordinary £1 shares was offered to the public. The prospectus, in addition to giving the customary financial information, included reviews highlighting the good and solid nature of the undertaking. One forecast claimed that once the Buxton extension had been completed, it would be one of the best paying lines in the country. The future was one thing, the present another. From the opening to the 30th of November 1904, the traffic returns were goods traffic, 251 tonnes, 500 weights, total passenger journeys, 21,511, goods receipts, 14 pounds, 14 shillings and 11 pence, Passenger receipts, 506 pounds, 12 and 5 pence. Total, 521 pounds, 7 shillings and 4 pence. 45% for the leak and manifold, 234 pounds, 12 and 4 pence. Without notice, at the close of 1904, the North Stafford introduced a reduced service for the months of December and January. This raised steam with the manifold directors. W.D. Phillips, General Manager, NSR. 
trains will run on Wednesdays and Saturdays only. This is unacceptable and is rejected by my board. We refuse to accept this working agreement. We require each way daily at least two trains in winter and three in summer. An understanding was reached. The manifold directors informing the powers at Stoke that they would appreciate notice in advance regarding any future modifications to the service. This level of service was maintained until the closure of the line. In May 1905, the company made an application under the Light Railways Act for further financial support amounting to £5,000 from the County Council and permission to issue £12,000 of debenture stock. On the 5th of June 1905, the standard gauge line from Cheddleton Junction was opened for passenger traffic as far as Ipstones and this is the site of the former Ipstone station. Behind me lies Leek and ahead Calden Junction from where one line went ahead to the quarries owned by the North Stafford and the other went down a steep gradient of 1 in 40 to Waterhouses station. The line entered the village on this high bridge and once over it the passengers had a good view of the station layout. Today it's hard to imagine that full gauge and narrow gauge tracks occupied this site. The only surviving structure is the goods shed and today you can hire cycles from here for a spin along the manifold trail. on the 1st of July, entering the station along this bank side. Below me here was a siding servicing this goods shed. And on the other side of this, there were three standard gauge transshipment sidings from where standard gauge wagons could be manoeuvred onto the manifold transporter wagons. And beyond, the narrow gauge run round loop arranged to serve the sidings. The standard gauge station, a wooden building, was a simple gable ended structure having a low-pitched slate roof together with a projecting platform canopy and provided waiting room and booking office accommodation. A run-round loop facilitated engine movements. The low narrow gauge platform was reached by a slope and was equipped with its own waiting room. Lack of space dictated that the room was no more than six feet wide but a generously proportioned roof spanned the full width of the facade resulting in a somewhat top-heavy appearance heating was not provided. A great annoyance to Sir Thomas Wardle, a director of the Manifold Company, who strongly objected to the inconvenience of having to use the North Stafford waiting room. As you can see, there's nothing to indicate the two stations ever existed. A road widening scheme in the 1960s reduced the area of the site, and now it's difficult to get an overall idea of what the stations looked like. But it is possible to imagine the scene here on the narrow gauge platform. It's Wednesday. The train from Leek has just arrived. From it emerge the farmers' wives laden with shopping baskets. Down the slope from the standard gauge platform, they hurry to climb aboard the manifold train. The starting signal indicates the road is clear. The guard waves his flag. The driver gives a friendly toot and the engine takes in a breath of steam and eases forward for its last run of the day. While all this was taking place, a porter would make his way from the station to where I'm standing now. And this is where the track crossed the main Leek to Ashbourne Road. It's much wider these days, but in those days, a single gate either side of the track operated by the porter held back the traffic. Once clear of the gates, the train gathered momentum down the 1 in 41 gradient into the deep and narrow valley, its whistle echoing round the hillsides all the way to Hume End. The opening of the full gauge line brought its rewards for the manifold company. Since the 1st of July, the takings have gone up by leaps and bounds. In July, there were 4,552 passengers, and in August bank holiday week, above 4,000 passengers made use of the line, the total number up to the 20th of August amounting to some 8,400. During 1905, a station shelter was erected at Ecton, and all the stations were provided with Moore's patent earth closets. 
12 were supplied at a cost of £11, 5 shillings each. Sir Thomas Wardle wasn't happy with their positioning. He wanted them moved to less prominent positions, especially at Butterton, the station where his guests alighted when they visited Swainsley Hall. At two points down the valley, refreshment booths met the excursionists' requirements for food and drink. These were supplied by the Portable Building Company of Fleetwood. It wasn't long before their tenants were calling for larger premises. In the event, Thor's cave booth was burnt down. Its replacement meeting the demand of its tenant, Mr Naylor. Similarly, the Beast and Tor booth was upgraded to meet the ever-increasing call for refreshment facilities. The summer of 1905 certainly brought a most encouraging number of excursionists and a measure of embarrassment. Some visitors, having bought tickets, were unable to make the journeys. Subsequently, a number made claims for the failure of the service to meet its obligations. Mr Phillips, no doubt with a smirk, made capital from the situation. All claims are your responsibility. It's clear that any overcrowding is in consequence of a deficient supply of accommodation by your company. I think that another summer we'd better put up the excursion fares during the months of July and August so as to limit the number of passengers requiring accommodation. Sunday afternoon services were introduced for July, August and September. Just two trains in each direction and timings were such that excursionists venturing out on the Sabbath had just over an hour and a half to spend at Hume End. Hardly sufficient time to enjoy tea and explore the countryside. The North Stafford were against any Sunday service as they objected to their railway staff being called upon to perform unnecessary Sunday labour and the church were equally unenthusiastic. By this time a coal yard had been established at Hume End. One merchant, William Shipley, was not at all happy over the delays with his supplies or the rates charged for delivery by the North Stafford. He made his feelings known in no uncertain terms to the directors. Sir Thomas Wardle felt that the goods traffic was increasing satisfactorily, pointing out the need for two more transporters. The North Stafford pressed for the early delivery of a covered van. The North Stafford announced they'd be quite prepared to convey milk from the valley stations at the owner's risk. However, a meeting of farmers pledged not to use the manifold service until the rate was the same as that from Hartington by the London and North Western. But the most significant communication was contained in a letter to the secretary of the Leak and Manifold from Parr's Bank in Leak. I am pleased to inform you that my directors have sanctioned an overdraft of £18,000 for three months against the individual guarantee of Mr Charles Bill, MP, by which time we understand he expects some different arrangement will be made with regard to the advance. Interest on the Treasury loan was paid, the directors pointing out that they'd seek to forego further payments for a few years owing to the difficulties their undertaking had encountered to allay fears that parishes might have regarding their liability should the county council sanction a further loan of £5,000, Colonel Bill and other directors held meetings at Waterhouses and Hume End. The full financial statement promised for the February of 1905 didn't emerge until the annual general meeting of February 1906. I intend to go through the accounts in detail to show how it has happened that the total expenditure has far exceeded the original estimate. Originally, £35,000 had been thought adequate. But the figure you have before you is not much short of 70000 The reasons behind the escalation have to be explained. Now, Mr Forsyth, the company's first engineer, estimated the construction cost to be £29,000. In practice, it turned out to be £42,177. The purchase of land similarly had been underestimated. £1,700 against some £6,000. The same applied to the working stock. £5,000 allowed. In reality, close on £10,000 was required. You will fully appreciate that we have a financial crisis. As you know, 
Our railway was supported by the Treasury. £17,500 as a free grant and £7,500 on loan at 3%. By the County Council, £10,000 as a loan, repayable by annual instalments of £426, 6 shillings and 9 pence, covering principal and interest during a period of 50 years and £15,000 of share capital. A further issue of £5,000 of share capital was invited at the close of 1904, but only £500 had been taken up. We also hope to obtain an additional loan of £5,000 from the County Council. As regards to an estimate of further expenditure on capital account, this will apply chiefly to Waterhouses Station, which, as you know, is now fully operational. Our share of the cost is limited to £2,000. We cannot make any certain estimate of future earnings, although we hope for an income for 1905 of about £850. As regards goods traffic, it will take some time for this to build up. I am disappointed to report that nothing has been done to develop the mineral resources of the district. In the light of the high price of copper, surely there must be sufficient incentive to reopen the Ecton mines. You gentlemen may rely upon the directors doing all in their power to increase the revenue of the line. But you must remember that the traffic managements are not in our hands, but in the hands of the North Stafford. I draw your attention to our overdraft at the bank. The interests amount to £669. To alleviate matters, we have asked the Treasury to allow their interest to rank after that due to the County Council. As to the balance of the overdraft, we have asked the Lights Railway Commissioners for powers to issue debentures, which, if sanctioned, would take priority over ordinary stock. I regret that it should be necessary to postpone the chance of a dividend, but I do believe the great bulk of shareholders put their money into the line for the purpose of assisting a promising local undertaking than of getting a dividend. The application for an additional loan of £5,000 from the Staffordshire County Council meant a public inquiry had to be held. This was to hear that in the rural parishes the price of coal had been reduced by two shillings a tonne, a shining example of the benefits brought by the light railway. However, the vice chairman of Alstonfield Parish Council said that in his opinion the line had not proved as beneficial as expected. The North Stafford having control fixed prohibitive rates and therefore in his mind the benefit to agriculture was limited. While some parishes approved the loan, Leek and Alstonfield opposed it. It was therefore decided to let the matter stand for six months. The interest on the Treasury loan has been suspended for three years. Congratulations on the tourist traffic. If the directors can arrange for the Buxton extension, they will be still more astonished. I will reroute the 615 from Hume End to Stoke via Leek. This will make the arrival at Stoke an hour later to that originally timetabled. This should reduce the number of excursionists, therefore removing the need for more carriages on the manifold, <laughs> and saving the expense. However, such action doesn't lend itself to my business instincts. I understand nearly all the milk traffic has been lost to the London and North Western. All we carry is 20 churns a day. The North Stafford do not encourage goods traffic. Their rates are in excess of the London and North Western. The Sunday milk train that started in February should be continued through the winter. We cannot afford to lose what trade we have to the London and North Western. A covered van was delivered last March to facilitate the carriage of milk churns. I am informed that milk contracts will be let from next April. To accommodate the farmers, a train will run from the first Sunday of that month for a period of 12 months. A further two transporters should be ordered from Cravens. 
We have agreed a price of £315 per car. While passenger journeys increased by 40% in 1906 and the revenue from goods traffic by a similar percentage, the resulting income was less than £800. To meet its financial commitments, the manifold directors had the burden of annual outgoings of almost £1,500, a figure that included the interest payable on the bank overdraft of £18,500, which would be reduced in severity by the decision of the County Council to advance an additional £5,000, repayable with interest for a period of 50 years. Matters financial clouded manifold skies. With regard to the extension, the North Stafford were only prepared to give their approval as far as Longner, a distance of four miles, which was as far as some of the directors wished to advance. Neither were the North Stafford interested in using stone from the Ecton tips as ballast for their tracks. Not encouraging news for the manifold directors, who'd been told by the Treasury that they considered the build-up of goods traffic to be far too slow reminding the company that their undertaking had been supported by £25,000 of public money. Early in 1907, the tenants of Sir Vaughancy Harper Crewe's Longner Estates petitioned him to support an extension of the line to Longner. But Harper Crewe couldn't understand how it would benefit them, and in any event, he would want full value of the land. But all was not lost. An alignment to the east of Manifold could be drawn up. What we want is Mr Finney to either give the land or sell it at agricultural value and invest the proceeds in shares. If the North Stafford would only consider Longner, the time had come to approach the London and North Western to establish if they would be interested in constructing the remaining length to Buxton. While details of the route were exchanged, the planned deputation to London to meet Sir Frederick Harrison, the general manager of the North Western Company, all came to nothing. The London and North Western were not prepared to either assist financially or lend their aid in any other direction. Collusion between Stoke and Houston? John Earle, now in partnership with Everard Calthrop, estimated that the cost of the Longner extension would be £21,000. One of the recently ordered transporters was delivered, and with it a headache to find the money to pay for it. We are endeavouring to sell surplus land to cover the cost, wrote Samuel Smith, the new secretary of the company, to Parr's Bank. Once again, the rates for carrying freight gave concern. Were the North Stafford setting excessive rates in order to keep down the traffic with the object of forcing the Leakin Manifold into liquidation so that they could get their hands on the line for a low figure? If the delights of the valley had worked their charm in 1906 in attracting 11,000 additional passengers, 1907 saw a reversal of fortune with a decrease of similar magnitude. A very great disappointment and attributed to a wet summer. One of the few joys of 1907 was for the farmers of Wetton, who were provided with a milk platform at Redhurst. In January 1908, the Manifold Company managed to pay £622, the interest payable against the two loans made by the Staffordshire County Council. By February, the financial position was grave. We are in a tight corner. We have to find £630 for the two transporter cars, one of which is in service, the other ready for delivery. How are we to meet our obligations with receipts from last year totalling only £552? In the event, the North Stafford loaned the money at 4% with surplus manifold lands as security. In an attempt to boost excursion traffic, Sharabank trips run by W. Webster were introduced. Nineteen oh nine saw a continuation of the service under an agreement with Commercial Cars Limited of London. Motor tours for residents and visitors. Road and railway excursions by motor Sharabank and train over the toy railway running through the beautiful Manifold Valley. From May 1906, Sunday summer service provided three trains in each direction. 
For the following years, summer services saw as many as six up and seven down workings on Saturdays, five trains in each direction on Wednesdays, and six on Thursdays. In 1909, the Treasury suspended interest on their loan for a further year, and the Staffordshire County Council for five years on their loan. In 1910, a 10-week charavang season was planned. However, due to very poor response, the service was suspended. At the annual general meeting, Colonel Bill announced... We have managed to pay the interest on the county council loan, but not the treasury loan, which had been suspended in 1907 and which is still deferred. The county council might think it necessary in the future to raise a small sum of money from the parishes served by their line. It has been agreed that Leek will contribute half the rate of other parishes and that the amount will not exceed one penny in the pound. The directors regret the necessity to call for financial assistance. The call will, however, not be a large one. And after all, the line is for the benefit of the neighbourhood. In 1911, the Manifold sought to renegotiate terms with the NSR. An agreement was put before the shareholders, said to be necessary in order to enable the company to raise debenture stock. Shareholders objected strongly to the agreement and felt that before accepting it, the company should obtain certain concessions. The agreement was voted upon and only passed on the casting vote of Chairman Colonel Bill. Opposition to events was soon forthcoming. Three directors appealed for opposition to the agreement in a carefully worded document. In their opinion, the proposed agreement ultimately would cause the shareholders to lose all the money they'd invested in the undertaking. The document was signed A.J. Hambleton, J.P. Sheldon, A. Hall. But in the end, a revised agreement for 14 years, with effect from January 1912, was introduced which set out fixed sums to be paid to the Manifold Company by the North Stafford, commencing at £675 per annum, rising to £750 by 1926. The agreement also included additional payments to be made in respect to new traffic. In order to reduce the bank overdraft, the Manifold Board issued £8,000 of the debenture stock previously authorised at an interest rate of 4%. The whole issue was taken up by Colonel Bill. With the consent of the County Council and the parishes guaranteeing the interest on the County Council loan, the debenture stock was given priority. The Treasury also accepted a similar arrangement, but wouldn't make any concession in respect to making their loan of £7,500 a free grant. 1914 saw the issue of the remaining £4,000 of debenture stock. While the £12,000 debenture issue reduced the bank overdraft, a public appeal was launched to reduce the remainder, a little short of £5,000. The response was disappointing, with only some £350 being promised. A bad year, little immediate hope, reported the Leak Post following the shareholders' meeting of 1915. Through illness, Colonel Bill was unable to attend. Mr. Hambleton took the chair. The company's bank are calling upon Colonel Bill to pay the bank overdraft, which he so generously guaranteed. We are sure that the district will appreciate their indebtedness we owe to Colonel Bill for all the trouble and anxiety he has had with reference to the light railway scheme, for the financial burden he has taken upon himself, without which there would be no light railway. The Directors, therefore, propose to issue a Lloyd's bond in favour of Colonel Bill for the amount of the overdraft at 4% interest. It was announced that the Lloyd's bond would take second rating behind the debenture stock and the loans from the Treasury and the County Council, but would have precedence over the share capital. In 1915, Charles Bill died. His executors paid the Manifold Company the amount of the overdraft to obtain release from the guarantee, and the donations from the public appeal were paid to Colonel Bill's executors. 1915 was the end of an era. The death of Colonel Bill had been preceded by fellow directors Sir Thomas Wardle, Professor Sheldon, 
and that of the company secretary, Edward Challoner. Much of the initial drive had been lost from the undertaking. Colonel Bill's place as a director was not filled, and he was succeeded by Mr. Hambleton as chairman. The war years brought little change to the valley, apart from a reduced frequency of service. In the event of England coming under attack by hostile aircraft, confidential documents issued by the North Stafford laid down procedures to be followed by its staff. The Home Office would notify the railway officials at Stoke, who in turn would convey the information down the line. However, while the Churnet Valley, the Stoke and Ashbourne lines were accommodated, the document failed to mention the branch to Waterhouses and the narrow gauge to Hume End. During the first full six years of operation of the manifold, 1905 to 1910, 183,030 passengers were carried. For the subsequent six years, this figure had fallen by 40% to some 110,000. In 1918, a creamery was established at Ecton by F.W. Gilbert Limited, later United Dairies, and a siding was laid to the factory, a positive boost for the manifold's ailing fortunes. If passenger returns didn't always live up to expectation, by this time, milk churns certainly made their presence felt. From 1911 to 1922, not far short of 260,000 churns rolled their way out of the valley, the Milky Way of North Staffordshire. This represented almost four and a half million gallons of milk. At this time, the churns were big 17-gallon capacity. One of the transporters was lengthened at Stoke Works to accommodate six-wheeled milk vans, so supplementing the carriage of churns by the manifold's own goods wagons. But while the healthy flow of milk brought its returns, this could not be said for those holding shares. Dealing had ceased in 1913. When approached for an indication of their current value, the company secretary put the figure at about sixpence, if that. A somewhat rosy expectation. 1922 saw the Manifold Company inquiring of the North Stafford whether they'd be willing to absorb the L&M under the provisions of the Railways Act of 1921. The reply from Mr Barnwell, the NSR General Manager, was that his company might be willing to submit to his directors a proposal to acquire the undertaking of the Manifold Company free from all obligations for the price of £15,000 payable in cash. The manifold directors replied that they could not see their way to negotiate the sale on the terms of the offer which they considered unrealistic. The 1921 Railways Act set out the scheme of allocation of £24.5 million among the companies, numbering 82, who were entitled to participate. The NSR allocation was £224,668, based on the net receipts for the year 1913, as detailed by the Act. And one director from the North Stafford Company was duly appointed to serve on the board of the London, Midland and Scottish Railway following the amalgamation. The LMS also absorbed the manifold paying £30,000 for a railway that was said to be losing £2,000 a year. So, new rules came into play. But while the North Stafford had freely advertised the beauty of the Manifold Valley, the LMS did little to highlight the many attractions to be enjoyed by riding narrow gauge along the tracks of its new possession. Soon after amalgamation, the LMS built a short transporter at Stoke Works. Two had been available on the opening day. Two had been ordered in 1906, making a total of five with the one that was delivered in 1923. A new owner brought new livery for the engines. From the original chocolate brown with a double white lining, the colour scheme changed to North Stafford Madder prior to 1923. Keen to present a new image, LMS Crimson Lake, lined black and yellow, arrived, but with one difference between the two locomotives. Unlike E.R. Calthrop, J.B. Earle carried the LMS crest on its bunker. However, this livery was in turn changed to unlined black. 
numbering of the engines by the LMS was not conducted. Similarly, the coaches had a new colour scheme too. From the primrose yellow of the early days, through Madder Lake, to the LMS Crimson Lake with numbering. As the Great War had brought to an end the Edwardian Age of Elegance, the infernal internal combustion engine heralded a change in the rural way of life. Lorries began to invade the district. Farmers bought cars and small bus owners skimmed the cream off the traffic by running buses on market days. The little railway carried on much as it had always done and during the summer months enjoyed popularity brought to it by its competitors. Scheduled motor omnibus services ran from Leek to Waterhouses and Butterton, while Sharabangs ran tours to the valley, setting down passengers at one end of the line and picking them up at the other. While the holiday breaks still pulled in the crowds, at other times as few as half a dozen passengers graced the majestic coaches and so receipts continued to fall and working expenses to rise. The only stable factor was the milk traffic from the Ecton Creamery, which was by this time being transported in glass-lined tanks every night to Finsbury Park in London, as well as in churns by ordinary vans. While milk flowed from the creamery, the flow of the river manifold was being contaminated by whey from the factory to the detriment of the fish. That was the popular story, but at this time reorganisation of the milk transport was underway, with lorries being used to take the milk to a few central dairies, such as the Express Dairy at Rosley. And so the creamery closed in 1932, and with it the lifeblood that had carried the manifold. In the February of 1934, the traffic committee of the LMS were to hear that receipts from the manifold were insufficient to keep the line open. The recommendation was for closure as from Monday the 12th of March 1934. It was suggested that if the line was kept open any longer, the permanent way would have to be replaced at an estimated cost of almost £14,000. Closure would save some £1,400 per annum, against an estimated loss of revenue of around £650. So, for a net saving of some £750, North Staffordshire's unique manifold was lost. Notice is hereby given that the Manifold Valley Light Railway section of the company's line, Waterhouses to Hume End, will be closed for the conveyance of all classes of traffic on and from Monday the 12th of March 1934 by order. Through wet and mournful white mists that veiled all the loveliness of the Manifold Valley, a romantic little train ran for the very last time today over the track it first used 30 years ago. And from tomorrow, the rugged, tortuous, almost uninhabited valley will be silent. When I joined the train at Hume End, they were loading it as I arrived. They brought out the scales from the office, the fire extinguishers, ink pots and pens, the safe, clocks, tables and chairs, and the store of unused tickets that now will never be punched. More passengers than are customary filled the single passenger coach. Some were sentimental passengers like myself, some country folk using the train as they had done for years, a few children being taken on an historic journey. No fuss or ceremony. One or two people watched the train on its last up journey. A long, whining whistle from the locomotive to acknowledge their farewells. On the train, I met Mr Billy Wood of Beeston Tor Farm, who told me that he was sorry to see the end. He could remember travelling down on the first train in 1904 recalling the new shining paintwork of the engine and carriages. He sadly confided that he would give up his shares to the company if it would help to keep the railway going and even buy some more. He didn't know how folks could manage. Poor little hamlets on the hill crest, poor little stations, poor little railway line, poor lovely valley. There was to be no rescue plan. The stations were left neglected, 
the rails rusted. Eventually, the rolling stock was taken to water houses where the coaches were put to the torch and burnt in 1936. The locomotive J.B. Earl was taken to Messrs. Cohen of Stanningley near Leeds to be scrapped. E.R. Calthrop pulled the demolition train taking up the track in 1937. In October, it was broken up at waterhouses. Thirty years before, the village proclaimed, a ray of light now gleams upon us. But now the light had finally gone out on the Leek and Manifold Valley Light Railway. But by then, the trackbed of the railway had been made into a footpath, after lengthy battles for and against it being made a road for traffic. The LMS handing over the site and the path being opened on Friday the 23rd of July 1937 at 3.30pm by Sir Joseph Stamp, GBE. Today there are still remains of railway buildings. Traffic does use part of the valley. But the manifold trail is enjoyed by the thousands who walk or cycle along its length. It's now almost a hundred years since the seeds were first sown to create a railway that was unique. The vision and hard work that went into its creation, the great plans and forecasts of its prospectus, and the devotion and sacrifices of its directors to keep it alive, all came to nothing. Initial undercapitalization, the shadow of the North Stafford, and the lack of interest shown in its narrow gauge assets by the LMS all contributed towards the closure of the line. A financial disaster there's no escaping. But for its short life of 30 years, it did afford the Moorlanders an alternative form of transport to market and the outside world. And the outside world access to a world far away from the smoke and grime of industrial towns. Set in a deep, narrow valley, with the villages and farms it was built to serve high on the hilltops, perhaps it wasn't surprising that things didn't work out as the promoters might have wished. Carrying heavy baskets to the valley stations, two train rides and a walk from Leak Station to the marketplace and the reverse operation at the end of the day must have seemed as equally demanding as the old-fashioned horse and cart or Shanks's pony. With the arrival of the horseless carriage, its future could never be rosy. But such an ingenious engineering work deserved a far better fate. Had it survived, there can be little doubt that today it would be among the top leisure attractions in the country. That may be conjecture, but there can be no doubting the fact that the winding pathway still attracts visitors in ever-increasing numbers. The Manifold Trail is a tribute to all those who, at the turn of the century, devoted their energies to establish the Leek and Manifold Valley Light Railway, and to those who, in later years, took the right path to ensure that the Manifold Valley and all its attractions are conserved for us all to enjoy in the moorlands of North Staffordshire. <laughs>